Grab your Bibles, let's do battle with the devil. The enemy is angry because you are being liberated this month. This means war. war. You are being opened up to the possibility and potential of the victory that already belongs to you. You are being equipped, you're being armed, you're being fashioned and positioned, you're being uh, elevated and increased, you're being favored, uh, you're being moved and removed, you're being situated in the middle of your victory. And I don't know anybody that should not be glad that you won. As a matter of fact, remind them from last week, congratulations. You, no, 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 tell, tell them like you really, you know, you don't like them, it's too late, you sat by them now, that's what you got. Turn to them and say, congratulations, you won. Global Campus family, I need you to just chat it up right now and just say, you won, you won, you won, you won. Congratulations, you won. Not you're winning. I know we have this new colloquialism that says winning. No, you ain't winning, you already won. The battle is fought and the victory is one, you're, feeding, you're, you're fighting a defeated foe. He's already conquered. Christ says, I've already overcome the world. That means Satan has already lost the battle and you have already been given the victory in Christ Jesus. Congratulations, you won. And so as we do battle with the devil, thank you, Holy Ghost. Speak through me and to me. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. I know that you've set this up. You sent us here. You positioned us. You situated us in this place. Now punctuated with your presence. The power of the Holy Spirit overtake us and overtake our minds and our hearts. That we might hear clearly and kill our ignorance with your truth. Cause us even now to be resilient in our thinking and more importantly in our actions. That we do not leave here the same way that we came. Cancel every demonic distraction, every demonic dart, every demonic vice that has been launched against our ability to understand, to grasp, and to put into practice what it is that you're going to deposit today. Open up our hearts and our minds with a clear understanding and where the power of the Holy Spirit resides, God, we ask that you would allow it now to manipulate this in ourselves and in our, in our uh, souls so strong that the enemy can't even pluck the seed of the word out of our hearts. Thank you right now, God, for canceling every demonic uh, curse that has been lodged against our bloodline. Thank you that you're liberating us even now that tomorrow is going to be greater and the next generation will be even greater and the next generation will go higher and deeper in the things of God. Let the favor of God fall on our bloodline, on our household. This is not just for us, God, but the work that we're doing in this space today is for the children and the children's children's children. Let them be beneficiaries of this moment that we have with you in this time, at this, at this particular juncture. Let them now even walk in the favor and the abundance that you promised through the father Abraham. Let it now transcend so that the blessings of God will be so innumerable that they'll be even greater than the seas of the seashore, on the seashore, sands on the seashore. God, we thank you that you're able to do these things so we don't act. Do not ask amiss. We do not ask in vain, but we ask in confidence, knowing that you're able to do even exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think. God, you are able to complete and to fulfill your perfect work within us. So do it, God. We're available to you. We're listening for you. Have your way in Jesus' name. Come on, put a seal on it. The devil can't break. Shout in Jesus' name. The 144th number of Psalm and reads as follows. Blessed be the Lord my strength which teaches my hand hands to war and my fingers to fight blessed be the Lord who is my strength who is your strength say it again who is your strength the Lord who is my strength which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight read it with me blessed be the Lord my strength which teacheth my hands to war and my... Okay, now jump over to 3 John, the second uh, verse. It's only one chapter. 3 John, the second verse. Yes, there is a third John. It's a third John. There is a third John. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou may prosper and be in health. The implication there is good health. Even as thy soul prospereth. I'm going to do it one more time. Beloved, I wish 
above all things that thou may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God, you sent it. You sent us. You set it up. Now get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. If you're just joining us this month, you have missed a, a phenomenal opportunity to encounter God in a way that causes you to walk victorious in every single area of your life. I don't want to end it without having the opportunity to make sure that we have uh, definitively and defiantly put inside of us that we are here to do battle and or to declare war against the lies of the enemy. Uh, remember, even as recent as last week, I had an opportunity to uh, illustrate, illuminate, to amplify that uh, the devil is not your problem. Uh, his lies are your problem. The, the enemy has already been defeated by God. And as long as God is God, then the enemies will be scattered. But the enemy is so tricky and so crafty, so beguiling, so slick that he will hit you with lies that cause you to believe the facade that he is painting that you are you are defeated, that you will not win, that you are already walking in uh, defeat, that there is no opportunity for you to uh, rebound, to recover, to acquire, to obtain, to build, to launch, to start, to buy, to have, even to keep and hold. And so the enemy is the father of lies. And what he does is he implements the the, the act of lies into our minds through the only thing that he has, the only weaponry, the only power that he possesses uh, in our lives is suggestion. It is not by any act that he commits. He simply suggests to us the lies that he has perpetrated, that he has perpetuated, that he has initiated. And if you gain or if you take in his lies, you begin to believe what he said over what God has said. So the only task in the battle that you have is to defeat the lies of the enemy. And the only thing that can defeat a lie is truth. When truth shows up on the scene, a lie can no longer stand. Truth is a light. Truth is revealing. Truth is unveiling. And so at the very moment truth is introduced into your mind, you begin to unveil. You begin to see. You begin to experience God in another way that causes the lies of the enemy to fall off like darts that have hit your shield of faith. Are y'all with me so far? Slap your neighbor and say, no child left behind. Keep up. We're going somewhere. So here it is. Uh, we've talked about over the weeks, uh, uh, well, first of all, let, let's make sure that they understand the theme, uh, the thematic principle that we've been dealing with all, all month long. This means, okay, the person next to you, they didn't really get it, so they just caught on. Now, let's give them a chance to jump in. This means war. war. Uh, over the course of the month, we've talked about God's power in this particular principle, uh, that his power is, is, uh, is innumerable, un insurmountable, infallible. It is eternal. It has no beginning, has no ending. It has no limitations, has no boundaries, has no demarcations. Is there anything too hard for God? The answer emphatically is no, because with him, all things are possible. Without him, nothing is possible. But you have the capacity to take this promise into heart and know that all things things God says you can do all things through Christ who gives you the capacity or gives you the strength if you with me say amen We've talked about God's power. We talked about the enemy of your purpose, that the enemy's purpose and his entire existence is to do three things. That is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he roams throughout the land like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To devour means to utterly consume. It means that there is no trace evidence that it ever even existed in the first place. So the reason the enemy has turned up his lies and the attack 
attacks have come in such a ferocious way is because he's trying to annihilate your thoughts which ultimately will take down your life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if he can get you to start thinking what he's saying over what God is saying, if he can think, if he can get you to start seeing instead of believing, if he can get you to start looking at the condition instead of looking at uh, the promise, then ultimately he will take down your whole life. But get this, he never has to lift the finger. He will make you self-implode and destroy yourself from the inside out. You've already planned your funeral and God is talking about your tomorrow. I want to make sure that you understand that the enemy's purpose is simply to take you off course and, and not allow you to live in divine purpose. Here's the thing that I want to throw this in. This is just a side note. This ain't in my notes. This is just a side note. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to charge you for this. This is for free. The side note is simply this. I'm looking at you, okay? You missed it. Went over your head. It went right. Come back. I got you. Come closer. Lean in. No, no. Lean in. I'm looking at you, which means that he did not get rid of the enemy evidence. The fact that you are sitting in the sanctuary with breath in your body, activity in your limbs, that you opened your eyes this morning and that you woke up and you were in your right mind. The fact that you were able to get into this space and into this place today means that his evidence tampering was not successful because I see some miracles. I see some healed cancer patients. I see some sickle cell been turned around. I see some breakthroughs. I see some signs and and I see some miracles and they look just like you. I've been through hell, but I made it and I am the evidence. Slap your neighbor so they can feel what a breakthrough feels like. Push somebody and say, this is what a miracle feels like. Ah, the enemy's purpose. We talked about God's power. We talked about the enemy's purpose. We talked about the parts of the armor. Last week I had an opportunity to break down here the parts of the armor. Here's what it is that God has equipped you with so that you can defend yourself against the darts and the wiles and, and the schemes of the enemy. Uh, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the, the belt of truth, having your feet shot in the preparation of the gospel. You, you, you have all of these things, the, these armaments, and then to make sure that your rear guard is up to par because he never gave you anything to, to put on for the rear. He knew that the enemy was not supposed to see your back, but he knows that the enemy is the master at stabbing you in your back. So he put two watchmen on your heels called grace and called mercy, called goodness and called mercy. So as a result you are covered from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Somebody ought to thank God you are covered. We talked about the power of God. We talked about the enemy's purpose. His dastardly plan. We talked about the parts of your armor. Your ability to protect yourself. But the one thing that we have not talked about and this is where the fight is going to take an interesting turn because a lot of things that we think are we're fighting uh, they're, they're, they're not what we're actually fighting. <laughs> yeah, we, we see what we see and so we think we are fighting what we see but, but really you're not even fighting things that you can see. You, 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 we, we took a lot of things into consideration. The power of God, the, the enemy's purpose, the parts of the armor but the one thing that we have not given consideration to in the middle of this battle. This means war in the middle of this fight and here it is. That's the condition of the soldier. Every military soldier on every level, I don't care what their rank is, if they come in as private, if they end up as five-star general, every single one of them on every letter, on every level, all of the greats all had to experience one specific key thing, and that is a physical. Before the uniform was put on, before weapons were handed out, before stars and bars were put on uniforms, before the military uh, wants to, 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 before the military uh, gives you an assignment, before the commissions are issued, every single one of them, the military wants to know one thing. What is the condition of the person that we will send to the battlefield? As a matter of fact, there is a process called MEPS, M-E-P-S, which is an acronym that stands for Military Entrance Processing Station. And in this, they want to know every single 
detail of every area of your physical capacity or your ability to your condition to go into a battle situation. Uh, they test your eyes. They want to know do you have double vision. Do you have a detached retina? Do you have, have you had surgery before? Uh, is there character conus? Is there glaucoma? Are there cataracts? Uh, have you had surgery? Is there night blindness? Any other condition? They test your hearing. They want to know is there any eardrum perforation? Any tubes been in, inserted? Is there a loss of vertigo? A loss of ba balance? Is there, uh, is there hearing loss or, or even the use of your hearing? They, wanna, they test your nose because they want to know if you have an ear, nose, or throat condition. Is there a vocal dysfunction? Can you talk? Can you scream, recurrent nosebleeds, chronic sinus infections? Is there sinus surgery? Is there an absence of something? Is there a deviation in something? They check your teeth. Come on, somebody. Have you had braces? Have you had aligners? Do you have any tooth or gum issues? They want to know about your lungs, your chest wall, your pleura, your mediastin, your stenum. Uh, they want to know, do you, have you had pneumonia? Is there a chronic cough? Is there frequent coughing at night? Is there a collapsed lung? Has there been a history of chest issues, chest wall issues? Is has there been any breast surgery or the prescription inhalers, any steroids in your system, any asthma, any bronchitis, any wheezing? They want to know about your heart. They want to know, do you have a heart murmur? Is there a heart valve problem? Are there palpitations? Skipped in abnormal heartbeats or pounding heart in your chest? Is there, is there heart surgery in your history? They want to know about your abdomen, your gastrointestinal system. Are there problems with your stomach, your esophagus, your intestines such as ulcers? Are there gallbladder diseases, gallstones, hernia, uh, hepatitis, jaundice, weight loss surgery? Surgery. They want to know about the females. Come on here, somebody. They want to know, have you been pregnant? Have you had any abnormal pap tests? Have you had a change in your menstrual pipe pattern? When does it start and when does it end? Has there been endometriosis, urine fibroid, or ovarian, ovarian cysts? And the males, they want to know, are there any undescended, uh, 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 descended testicles or testicular implants or scrotal mass or swelling or pain or prostate problems? In the urinary tract, they want to know, are there any painful or difficult difficulty with urination, any kidney stones, any, any kidney or urinary tract disease, any surgeries, any infections. They want to know about your spine. They want to know about your neck pain. Uh, are, are there any abnormal curvatures in your spine, vertebral uh, fractures that you've experienced? Uh, they want to know about every extremity of your body, your vascular system. Are you pale? Are you blue? Is there any numbness or tingling in your fingers or your toes? They want to know about your foot condition. They want to know about your knees. They want to know, have you had knee surgery? Any swelling, any weakness, any numbness? any stiffness, any hip, knee, foot, ankle, or toe problems, any dislocation in this area. They want to know about your vascular condition. Uh, do you have high blood pressure? They check your skin. They want to know, is there any acne? Are there any rashes such as atopic dermatitis or eczema or psoriasis? They want to know about your blood, anemia, blood clots, absence or removal of the spleen. They look at your individual systems. Uh, they want to know about your endocrine and your metabolic, uh, metabolic system. Them. The thyroid, is it functioning? The diabetes of hypoglycemia, glycemia, is it present? Neurologic things, sleep disorder. Do you have any sleepwalking, narcolepsy? Are you difficult falling asleep? They want to know about your psychiatric behavior. Do you have PTSD? Are there any personality disorders? What is the history in your family? They want to know about your eating disorders, your self-inflicted injuries or cutting or burning or suicidal thoughts or gestures or attempts. They want to know about tumors. They want, they want to know about supplemental questions like do you have any prosthesis or any fake body parts or, or do you have any previous medical disqualification or there's any other discharge in your they ask everything under the sun they want to know it all but listen when you come to serve in church the only thing we have been trained to ask is can you serve Because the military has figured out it is a tragedy to send a wounded soldier into battle. One of the mistakes we make as leaders and people in church ministry is that we don't take a physical before we put you to work in the ministry. We simply hand you a title, put you on a team, boast about how many volunteers we have, share how many members we have without knowing the soldier's well-being. And we want to know why things aren't functioning the way they could or should be functioning. 
Here's one question I'm asking. Uh, it's for the past uh, and it's for moving forward. We, we graduate new members. We, we, we take gifts assessments. We know their skills. We know their ability and their availability. But there's one question that we've neglected to ask, and I'm backing up to ask this question. Let me repent and apologize to you up front. I'm asking for the past, and I'm asking for moving forward. How you doing? Are you okay? How, how's your family doing? How's your health? How are your finances? How's your sleep? How are you doing? I, I'm not asking you to learn the next song. I'm not asking you to show up early for prayer. I'm not, I'm not asking you to be a part of our corporate assembly of prayer. I, I'm simply asking one question to you today, and that is, how are you doing? All the pastors that I've coached and even some of the pastors who are friends of mine who are a, a part of ministries and, and serve as leaders in their in, uh, individual capacities, we, we've all constantly complained to one another, and I'm just going to give you preacher talk and let you behind the veil for a few minutes, but... We've all complained about some of the same things about people who betray us. Because anytime you are dealing with people, that is a side effect of dealing with people. Uh, people that don't commit. People that say, we're going to be with you. Well, I'm good. I got your back, pastor. And they're nowhere to be found when the rubber hits the road and the bullets start flying. People who leave without even telling you bye. You were there at their bedside, but they won't be there at your bedside. You were there for their mess, their faults, their failures, but they abandon you if you have one. Or simply express agendas that don't align with the vision. But the issue is not what they've done. I want to conclude something different. This is a different thesis than I've taken in the past. It's not with what they've done. The real issue is what was their condition when they came? Many pastors, we can tell you, I, I know I do. I know when you're absent. I know when I haven't seen you sitting in your seat in your section for a few weeks now. I know your skill set. We, we, we as pastors, we know how much money a person gives every year. I know y'all don't think we know. We know. We know where you serve. We know what you contribute. We know how frequently you contribute it. But not many of us know, in general, in collective, not many of us know how you're doing. In Proverbs, the 27th chapter and the 23rd verse, it says, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. It's not even an option. It's a mandate that we know how are you doing. How healthy are you? I want to know how healthy you are emotionally, spiritually, relationally, physically, financially. How, how healthy are you? Here's the, here's the challenge. This is why this is so important to me. This is why God said instead of turning your attention outward on this last one of this series, I'm going to need you to turn it inward. Because we're trying to take the city. But we're having problems taking the city with wounded people. I'm asking God, I'm asking God personally, and I'm asking my intercessors to agree with me. I'm asking God that there be 1,000 strong, prosperous, anointed men added to our church. 1,000. I'm not going to rest until we hit 1,000. I am intentional when I say men. I am over the next 18 months committing myself personally to reaching these 1,000 men. I am pushing my team in the back to say your strategies should shift towards this end that we have strategies and tactics that are intentional about reaching 1,000 men and have them be added to our church. Do you understand and I didn't get to preach here last week for Father's Day, the same sermon that I preached in Atlanta. But do you understand that men are the primary target of the enemy? All be clear. He attacks everything and everybody. Men, women, boys, and girls. 
but his ultimate goal is to destroy the man because the man carries nations in his loins. If I can take out the man, I will destroy the family structure. And family is the whole purpose for why God set this thing up. Even the language God uses is family language. He says, when you pray, say, our father. For God so loved the world that he sent not an, a, a CEO, not an executive, not an ambassador, not a volunteer. But he sent his only begotten Son, He even uses language of family and he talks about us being engrafted into his family because this is the foundational practice and principle of the Bible. There's only two main things and that is redemption and family. So if he can smite the head, which has been constituted, instituted and positioned by God, then the rest of the family will just scatter. Are y'all with me? So I am intentional when I say I need an army of men because if I have an army of men, I don't know if y'all figured it out, but sisters show up when the men are present. Oh, bless his name. Over the next 18 months, that is my commitment. But here's the challenge. I can't work with wounded warriors. We need to be healed. And why is it so important that we're healed? Here it is, real simple. Because wounded, wounded people att attract demonic warfare. Wolves smell wounds. And as soon as the enemy identifies a wounded warrior, he will turn his attention directly to that person. It's the, it's the whole concept of divide and conquer. He's looking for the wounded warrior who is away from the rest of the, of the flock. He does not want to just go after the whole herd of healthy sheep, but he's looking for the wounded because a wounded warrior puts off an, a wounded warrior puts off an odor, but a praising warrior puts off an aroma. So if I can wound you, guess what? You won't even feel like praising. That's why the scripture commands us that we are to yet praise him. Even in the middle of our circumstance, we have to find the measure of strength to give him a sacrifice of praise. Because if we're not willing to make the sacrifice and don't have capacity and strength to praise God, we can't ward off the attack of the enemy and the enemy starts sniffing you out because now you're giving off a putrid odor because you're no longer giving off an aroma. And the moment you praise God, the enemy enemy has to leave you alone let me help you understand because God says I live in I dwell in I make myself at home in the praises of my people so if you are wounded and you want to be healed the first step in your healing is to learn how to bless God in the middle of your pain I will bless to bless means to speak well of I will declare his goodness I will decree his th his great I will position my mouth so that out of it comes your praise. Let me tell you why I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall come. Continually. That's not accidental. The, the, the God is trying to arm you so that the wolves will leave you and your herd alone. Ain't nobody wounded over here. And the good shepherd has just shown up on the stream with his rod and his staff. He will protect me from the wolves. Help me, Holy Ghost. When you become wounded, you give off an odor. Your attitude stinks. Your praise is absent, void, vacant, gone. You don't want to go to church. You don't want to be around church people. It's because you're wounded. And as long as you're wounded, you are susceptible to the attacks of wolves. The enemy will send demonic principalities and they'll start wrestling you with depression and anxiety and stress. You'll be so overcome on the inside, he won't ever have to touch you on the outside. 
in, in boxing, in, the, in every corner, there, there is a corner man. The corner man is paying attention to the fight on another level. See, other people are looking at it for enjoyment. Other people are looking at it because they're cheering for their favorite boxer. But the corner man is looking at the fight because he's trying to assess where are the enemy or the opponent's weaknesses. So the enemy sets up a corner man and he looks to see where are you favoring? Where are you, when you get punched here, how do you fall? Where are you suffering? Where are you wounded? Because he then tells the demonic principalities, every time we hit them in the finances, they lose their joy. Every time their relationship goes south, they lose their peace. Every time that we snatch something out of their hands or move something or delay something warring against the heavenlies, then they lose their praise. So keep hitting them right there. That's why you've got to learn how to shake it off and give God praise anyhow. You've got to learn how to tell him thank you when it's hurting. How to tell him glory when you're in pain. How to give him honor when you don't feel like it. Is there any warriors in here today that is ready to do battle with the devil and shake him off with your praise? Open your mouth and bless. That's his name. You are in a battle. Whatever you're fighting now didn't just start. Help me, Jesus. Your attack started many, 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 many years ago. The devil is not your age. He, he wasn't born when you were born. He didn't start because you came. Everyone in this room has what is called a bloodline. And many, 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 many years before you saw your ancestors, he started attacking your bloodline. Something that has passed through to you through your blood, it's part of your DNA, it's part of your makeup, and the enemy started attacking your family and your bloodline with this before you ever, you never even met some of the ancestors who were a part of the fight that you are now fighting today. Which is why, which is why we, we need the blood of Jesus. Because our blood is tainted. Satan did a blood test. And said this is what your grandmother did. So this is what I'm going to cause you to fight with. This is the battle I had with your grandfather. He wrestled with this. So I'm going to use this and cause you to have to wrestle with it in this day. Deuteronomy 7 and 9. Sometimes you're fighting stuff. Your ancestors, uh, of, of ancestors that you haven't even met. Deuteronomy 7 and 9 says there. Therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. The faithful God which keeps his covenant. And mercy with them that love him and keeps his commandments to thousands of generations. God is a generational God. The enemy is not fighting you in the now. He is fighting you for your generations. So to begin to assess your condition. To begin to see the very depth of your woundedness, of your issues, of your struggles. You got to check your bloodline and see what's prevalent in your bloodline. Uh, if alcoholism was a part of your bloodline, then you are susceptible. This is medically proven. You are more susceptible to becoming an alcohol, uh, alcoholic, not because of socialization, but because it has been passed through your DNA. So there is not an accident to how this thing works. The enemy is trying to attack your bloodline. Come here, son. Come here. Both of y'all, come on. Come on, quickly. Come on. Come on. 
I, I just want to illustrate. I, I want to illustrate how this, how this works. Y'all stand right here, and you all come right here. I want to stay right here. Stay right in front of me. Face that way. Got it? Okay. Every proclivity, every issue, every demonic attack, every dastardly deed, it, it, it looks as if I'm wrestling with it. Come on, divorce, rejection, lustfulness. It looks as if these are my fight, but the, but the reality is I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting them for myself. They're trying to get to my babies. So I gotta pray like I've never prayed before. I gotta shout like I've never shouted before because you cannot, not my family, not my children. Hold on. Come here, Todd. Come here, hold on, hold on. I'm wounded. I'm out of breath. I have fallen. I have stumbled. I have cried. I have crawled. I have struggled. I have strained. And then comes Jesus. He is the interrupter. So now, this battle, this ain't my fight no more. This is his fight. All I got to do is turn and cover my children. Because everything that I needed to kill, that the enemy was trying to send into my bloodline, I've got Jesus, who is the divine interrupter, that says, you can't fight my blood. Y'all can go. Y'all can go. Y'all can go. Here it is. Watch this. Whatever battle you lose, your kids will fight. Whatever battle you lose, your kids will have to fight. Divorce. I, I, I want you to understand that my parents, they have been participants in this process. They are curse breakers. Because 50 years of perseverance, prayer, struggles, forgiveness is the illustration that my wife and I needed to make it to year 25. And so my children and their children have an opportunity to walk in unity with their spouse because they are cursed. So the stuff that you defeat in this season, impurities, tendencies, habits, struggles, contaminants, bad relationships, bad associations, bad affiliations. The stuff that you fight off and win in this season will give your children and your children's children and your children's children's children an opportunity to walk in divine liberty. Jesus is the interrupter. The only way to transfer anything is from the existence, human existence, is through the blood. My children have the right to my inheritance because they are my blood. Be before you fight forward, you're going to have to learn how to fight backward. You're going to have to stop and deal with some stuff that is behind you. You know the things that your family won't discuss and talk about. 
You know the secrets that they will not allow to be raised and to be elevated, to be dealt with, to be discussed until the funeral of the one that is about. You're going to have to fight what has been attacking your bloodline before you're able to see God do miraculous things in your tomorrows. In the 11th chapter of Genesis, there was a man named Terah. Terah is the father of Abraham. Abram, who becomes Abraham. I want you to know that Abraham was sent. He said, go to a land that I'll show you. Abraham, in obedience, did exactly that. Packed up his family. Unfortunately, took his, his, son, his nephew Lot, who was the son of his brother that had gone on to be with the Lord or that had died, named Haran. So Terah went to a city that was named after his deceased son called Haran. When he gets to Haran, his assignment was to go to Canaan, which is the promised land. But when he gets to Haran, it was a city that was named after the son that he had lost. So he does not make it past Tehran, but he, go, he does not go to Canaan, which is the only reason Abraham had to be given the instruction to go to the promised land in the first place. Because his daddy, who had the first marching order, Terah, got stuck in Haran. Remember, Haran was the name of his deceased son. So Haran being the place that represented the son that had died, he got stuck in the place of his pain. He never made it to Canaan because he got stuck in his pain. Isaac then was given to Abraham. Abraham decided to take matters into his own hand. He went and got uh, Hagar, and from Hagar he birthed Ishmael. But God says, this was done on your own account. This was not legitimate, so you have to send them away. And God says, I told you I was going to bless you with a son, so here's Isaac. But because your father was tested in this area, I told him to go from his homeland to Canaan, the promised land, but he got stuck in the place of his pain because it was a reminder of the son that he had lost. So your first test, when I give you your marching orders, is going to be this. I need you to take your son and march him up the hill, and I need you to take his life because I to know whether or not you got the same issue that your daddy had. When he gets up there, Abraham spared not his son as Jesus, as God rather, spared not his only begotten son. And when he raised his hand, God says, Abraham, stay your hand. If you turn around, there is a, a, a ram stuck in the thicket. I've already made provision so you don't have to take your son's life. But he makes one statement. And that statement is the one that I hope he makes about you when you get confronted with your next struggle. The one statement he makes is, now I know. How? How, God? How? How can you say, now I know? You're omniscient. You're all-knowing. There is nothing you do not know. You know everything. You know all things. There is nothing that is outside the purview of your possibility, your scope of understanding. How and why would you say, now I know? Because God knows everything potentially. He knows everything historically. But he does not know everything experientially. In other words, God cannot know and experience until he has it so every time you defeat the enemy you give God a new experience in your life every time you tell the devil no I will not it will not happen I'm not doing it I will not bow down I will not succumb I will not lose this battle I will not lose this fight you give God a new experience with you because you show him through experience what faith and confidence in God actually look like so that's why he said, now I know. 
because Abraham broke the curse. Abraham refused to allow even the love of his son to interfere with his love for God. He broke the curse on their bloodline. And as a result, watch this, Abraham's family is known as the first family of faith. Abraham has a prominent place in the faith hall of fame. Abraham is known not because of what he did, not because the mountains he moved, the armies he defeated. Abraham is known because of the faith that he had in God. So uh, what's beating on your back? What's trying to take you out? What's trying to pull you down is actually the trauma of your bloodline. And once the enemy sees an area of defeat in your bloodline, he feels like now it's legal for him to attack you in the area that your bloodline has failed. You got places of trauma that you're going to have to deal with. Molestation, rape, abuse, rejection, abandonment. You're wondering why you can't seem to get it together in the now. It's because you haven't dealt with the then. When you have trauma in your bloodline, you got to understand that it, it does several things. First of all, it alters your personality. You don't even act like you would act had you dealt with what you needed to deal with. Tendencies. You, you start acting in a specific way and the pattern follows you through every relationship, every encounter, and every circumstance that you have. You, are starting a, you, you start adopting sinful passions. You start wanting to do things that just feed your flesh and make you feel good. You adopt fears and phobias. Some of you won't even get in a relationship because of the bad one that you, you had before. Fears and phobias. Some of you won't even drive because you were in a car accident later, uh, previously in life. You start abandoning your divine purpose. Because fear is a paralytic. Fear prevents you from moving forward, so you stand where you are, and God is not a God of stagnation. He's a God of progress. So as long as he can keep you paralyzed in fear, he will keep you out of walking in purpose, and if he can keep you out of walking in purpose, he'll keep you from walking in God's power. So, so, so Pastor, I need to fix it. <laughs> I don't know how. It's simple. You need the blood. You, you, you need a blood transfusion. When we, are, when we receive Christ, uh, his spirit begins to dwell within us and he regenerates us. To regenerate, if you look at the, the, the word that is the root of that word, to regenerate is simply to regene. Every single one of us is a compilation of genes. And so when he regenes or changes your DNA... He ultimately changes your potential and he gives you a, an, an assured destination. So why do I need the blood? Well, well the, here's what the blood of Jesus does. When you receive Christ, the blood begins to work on your behalf. Jesus steps in between you and what would have been. And he positions himself so that the only thing that the enemy is reminded of is the power that was exhibited by the blood he shed on Calvary's cross. But, but, but pastor, why do, I, why do I need the blood? Because Jesus' blood interrupts the, 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 the blood flow. It changes the DNA. It changes the, the demonic curse that has been placed on your family. It changes the attacks that were lost by your ancestors. It changes your outcome because it gives you a clean slate. He washes you through his blood. Though my sins be as scarlet. Though my sins stain my soul, the blood of Jesus cleanses and washes away all unworthiness and all unrighteousness. And he constitutes us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the blood interrupts the flow of the enemy's blood that has now seeped in and sin that has come through generations. You want to know why you're fighting what you're fighting? It's because it's been passed down through your blood. Adultery, lasciviousness, alcoholism, addiction, drug addiction, low self-esteem. Come on, somebody. Depression, anxiety, 
hypertension, cancer, sickle cell, diabetes. It has then come down through the blood. But God says, beloved, above all things, my wish, my desire is that you prosper and be in good health. So much so that I'm going to send my son to shed his blood, which will hit the mercy seat. And through my mercy, I will wash away what was and give you what I desire you to have. Jesus, second reason is that because Jesus' blood sets you free. He whom the, the son sets free is what? Is free indeed. There is no reason. There is no reason for you to walk around in bondage to the enemy. Worried about what the enemy is going to do. Thinking about what other people are saying behind your back and around you. Because you are free from the penalty and the sting and the hold up of fear in your life. I don't have to worry about what they say. Because my focus is on what he said. He said, I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I am above. I am not beneath. I am the lender. I am not the boss. He said, I'm a royal priesthood. He said, I am peculiar by choice. He said, I'm a holy set apart, set aside for his glory nation. He said that I am healed by his stripes. He said, I am redeemed by the blood of the lamb. He said that the penalty of my sins has been canceled and he exchanged it with everlasting life. He said that I will put on a garment of praise and he'll trade me my weariness for his praise. He said that I am more than a conqueror because of him who loves me. He said, blood of Jesus interrupts it sets you free but lastly it, 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 it makes sure that you understand that the fight goes off of you and goes on to him he says why why are you still fighting so hard I've already beat this man I conquered him on the cross death burial and the grave and all of the attributes and all of the, the dynamics that that I had to endure. I didn't do that for nothing. I did it for you. And now I'm telling you. The battle doesn't even belong to you. It's my battle. All I need you to do. Is start trusting in what I've said. Over what you see. I need you to know the strength. That I have given in your bloodline. What I have put in practice and in place. To correct the wrongs of the enemy. Through your history. I've given you the assurance of knowing I am God. So all the battles go off of me and they go on to him. But the challenge is we've got a seductive, slick devil. And his whole premise is to beguile and seduce you away from the will and outside of the word. Because he knows then you are open for his attacks. So the best thing you can do is stay in the will and follow in obedience his word because the enemy can't get to you. Thank you, Jesus. Then when, when you're walking according to his will and you're walking in his way, when you're honoring his word, when you're being obedient to his truth, he says this, he says, now uh, you're blessed in the city. I'm going to make sure that you are blessed in the field. I I'm going to even position you that, that when you're coming and when you're going, whether you're in, whether you're out, whether you're up, whether you're down, whether you're on the bottom or you're on the top, whether you're in the back or whether you're in the front, I'm going to make sure that the blessings that I promised to your father Abraham come down through generations and attach themselves in the form of favor to your family. That means your children are going to be blessed. That means their marriages are going to make it. That means they will have increase and in favor. That means your grandchildren will turn around and call you blessed. That means God's going to 
give you a crown of righteousness. God's going to trade you and give you the greatness of who he is and your children and your children's children's children will be beneficiaries of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the favor of God. Increase is coming. Deliverance is going to hit your household and things are going to have to change around. You can stop worrying about your babies. God says because of your prayer, because of your commitment, because I canceled the sin of yesterday, I'm going to arrest the pain of tomorrow and I'm going to give them the promise that belongs to them. Oh, bless his name. This is not for me. This ain't for you. But for your children and your children's children. I need you to release a sound of confidence. Come on. That looks like praise. Come on. I need you to release a sound of confidence in this place that tells the devil you lose our win. And my children and my children's children are beneficiaries of the blessing of God. Come on right now. Don't you wait on your neighbor. Bless God in advance. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. I see your future. It looks better than it does now. Glory to your name, God. Glory to your name, Jesus. The curse has been broken. The sin has been interrupted. The habits and addiction have been canceled. The sickness has been reversed. Satan the liar, you're going to tell us that I'll have to deal with this from now on, but you are a liar and the truth is not to be found within you. I choose to believe the report of the Lord. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of my peace is upon him and by his stripes I am healed. I am redeemed. I am restored. I am set free. I am delivered. I am victorious. I am a conqueror. I am who God says I am. I will have what God says I can have. My children will be blessed. My grandchildren will be prosperous. Increase will follow my family for the rest of our days. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. You have no power or authority in our lives. We take authority over our bloodline and everything that the devil meant for evil. God, turn it around and work it for our good. Let the test become our testimony. You said, God, that we overcome the enemy by the power of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We are the testimony. What tried to get my mama, what tried to get my grandmother will never be able to take me and my children. What tried to attach to my daddy, what tried to attach to my granddaddy will never be able to wipe out our children. We are the victorious ones. We are the conquering ones. We are the warring generation. We are the people of God and we know who we are. We're going to do great exploits. Greater work shall come than these. Greater work shall come than these. Greater is coming. Increase is coming. Deliverance is coming. Healing is coming. Power is coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. take, the Bible says do it as often as you shall, we take communion for two, two general reasons. One is to remind us of who Jesus is. The other is to remind the devil of what Jesus did. The worst thing that you can do is keep reminding the enemy. It's the best thing for you, but it's the worst thing for him. To keep reminding him that you lost. What are you trying this for? You remember that time, you remember that time on the cross? You want to shut somebody down in an argument, just tell them about the time they got whooped. 
You, 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 remember that, you remember that time y'all beat him? Y'all put thorns on his head and sweat and blood ran down. And, do you remember that time? Do you, do you remember that time when, uh, when y'all marched him through the judgment halls? And Do you remember that? <laughs> Say, come on now. You, you remember. Oh, no, you, you remember. And, and remember y'all beat him until he was almost lifeless until blood flowed down his back. That he had, had, had excruciating agony and pain. He cried out until heaven became dark. The, the low misery of the angelic hosts. You remember? You remember because y'all mocked him and spat on him. And, wow, where's your God now? If thou be the Christ and save yourself and save us, come down from me. You remember, you remember that time? You remember that saying? I know you remember that. I know you do. And remember y'all laid him on the ground and, and you put nails in his wrists and you put nails in his feet and you put him on a cross and then y'all raised him and put him in a hole that you had staked in the ground. You remember that? And y'all even, y'all, as to make matters worse, you mocked him so much that you put him between two common thieves and you knew he was innocent and knew no sin. You, you remember that? And, and blood and sweat and tears from his face were falling down. You made his mama sit there, his earthly mama sit there and watch his agony and pain. You spat on him, you mocked him, you abused him. You remember that? And then you all, you, you, you even went so far, you said, no, this ain't enough. We got to take his life. We need to end him. Y'all pierced him in the side until blood and water, which is an indication that it also pierced his lungs. And he hung his head and he died. And you laughed. Y'all took his clothes and sold it to make mockery out of him. You, come on, Satan. I know you remember that. I know you do. You remember it. And, and, and when, you, when you mocked him, you didn't say, all right, y'all can take him now and go bury him. And they put him in the borrowed tomb. It wasn't even... It wasn't even the tomb that he could afford, that his family had compensation to be able to afford it, put him in a borrowed tomb. But, 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 you, you remember that last part, right? Three days later, y'all showed up at the tomb, but the tomb was empty because the blood that he shed, you didn't realize it at the time because you thought that you took his life. But the blood that he shed ran down to the mercy seat so that every sin, every pain, every sickness, every anxiety, every test that the enemy would throw that you would come at him with later was already defeated because three days later he was raised from the dead. And he came out with keys to death hell and the grave and he says I have all power that means whatever you've been wrestling with God has the power and the keys for your release 